channel's Week in Review. Left-wing Israel lobbying group J Street prepares its first national conference where it stands on the issues, why these men are concerned for the future of Jewish delis, women breaking down barriers in the Orthodox clergy, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world in this webcast version of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. J Street is the name of an organization you'll be hearing a lot about in the coming weeks. The group that describes itself as a liberal mainstream alternative to the more prominent Israel lobbying group APAC is holding its national convention October 25th through the 28th and is touting the fact that more than 160 members of Congress have joined its host committee. For an organization that's made plenty of headlines and been invited alongside other Jewish groups to meet President Obama, J Street will likely see its prominence rise further. But what exactly is J Street's agenda, and why are many other Jewish groups, including the current Israeli government, not entirely pleased with the group? Here's everything you need to know about J Street in just three minutes. J Street came into existence in the spring of 2008, and the invitation to its first fundraiser, reported in the New York Jewish Week, announced for too long the loudest American voices in political and policy debates have been those on the far right, often Republican neoconservatives or extreme Christian Zionists. J Street aims to change that. We are the first and only lobby and political action committee dedicated to ensuring Israel's security, changing the direction of American policy in the Middle East, and opening up American political debate about Israel and the Middle East. J Street announced that its agenda was pursuing a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But the general idea of pursuing a two-state solution is nothing new to the left or the right. Former President George W. Bush made headlines announcing his goal of a Palestinian state in 2002. The specifics of how to get to that Palestinian state is where the real lines are drawn. And at its launch, J Street was advocating negotiations with Hamas. Soon after, 74% of American Jews surveyed by the American Jewish Committee said they didn't think Israel could achieve peace with a Hamas-led Palestinian government. Since J Street from the start has asserted it is representing a, quote, silent majority of American Jewish liberals, it's valuable to take a moment to understand what American Jewish liberalism is. An overwhelming majority of Jews vote Democratic. Much of the time, the tally is more than three quarters. However, Democratic policy and J Street policy aren't necessarily the same thing. On negotiations with Hamas, for example, President Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden have always maintained in public statements that Israel must not be asked to negotiate with Hamas. And J Street's own polling indicates this divide. A March 2009 poll found that roughly three-quarters of American Jews approved of President Obama's handling his job as president, and that 72 percent approved of his handling of the Arab-Israeli conflict. This suggests that J Street's polling shows large majorities of American Jews do approve of the president's policies in these areas. As a point of reference, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had a 58 percent favorable rating in the same poll. But with some of the specifics of J Street's policies, American Jewish opinion moves in the other direction. The first major Israeli policy issue to arise during J Street's existence was the incursion into Gaza by the Israeli military in early 2009, an incursion that J Street strongly opposed, saying that it would make Israel less secure. But J Street's polling showed only 25 percent of American Jews disapproved of the incursion, and only 18 percent agreed with J Street that it made Israel less secure. However, there are indications that J Street is becoming more of a mainstream voice, though it's unclear whether that's a result of any change in policy. President of the Union for Reform Judaism, Rabbi Eric Yaffe, who was initially critical of J Street, is speaking at the conference. And while the Netanyahu administration has announced it won't send representatives, the Obama administration is dispatching National Security Advisor Jim Jones, though no one from the State Department. Those 160 members of Congress on its host committee are noticeably less than attend APAC's annual convention, but a sizable number for J Street's first ever conference nonetheless. Though recently, New York Senators Charles Schumer and Kirsten Gillibrand pulled out of the conference. So while J Street is gaining in mainstream credentials, it remains unclear whether in continuing to claim to represent the American Jewish majority, J Street will change its policies to actually represent the mainstream of American Jews or whether it will try to convince the mainstream of American Jewry to adopt its policies. We'll have coverage of the conference in next week's newscast, where you can find out. Well, while American Jews have disagreements about how to keep Israel safe, Margie Rauhat found an effort to protect another Jewish resource, the deli. Here's her report. It's kind of like a Jewish version of the meeting of the five families, the royalty of Jewish delicatessens gathering to talk about the state of their business. They came together here at Ben's Deli to celebrate a new book, Save the Deli, alongside entertainers like Jelvis, the Jewish Elvis, and Borscht Belt comic and dean of the Friars Club, Freddie Roman. Oh, I love pastrami, I love corned beef, I love hot dogs. I'm a deli freak. 
My cholesterol is 840, but I love it. The party highlighted the foods they love and the culture surrounding it. A culture that, says author David Sachs, we're in danger of losing if we don't all start eating more pastrami, corned beef, and pickles. The Jewish deli has been in peril for some time. There used to be thousands of Jewish delis in New York alone, and now there's just a couple dozen. There's a saying that with a culture, the first things to go are language, so Yiddish has, has really faded away, very few people speak it, um, and religion and, and the re rates of intermarriage and synagogue membership are obviously declining. And food is that last holdout, that last vestige before total and complete assimilation. Which brings Sachs to a pointed question. If you can't eat a pastrami sandwich, what makes you a Jew? To hear what these prominent deli owners talk about when they get together, and the latest song in praise of cured meats, see the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Margie. While there are plenty of Jewish artists of significant reputation in the world today, not many of the leading Jewish artists focus on Jewish themes. That's what makes Toby Kahn's work so distinct, and why his art was singled out for a special honor, as Christian Needham reports. He's the first Jewish artist to have an exhibition of his own at the Museum of Biblical Art, or Mobia. The opening of Toby Kahn, Sacred Spaces for the 21st Century, marked a historic moment for the museum. I'm the first to have a solo show at Mobia, and I'm very honored. These are four sacred spaces, and I wanted it to be shown at an institution that really believes in sacred space, and, you know, Mobia was a perfect museum for it. And there's a specific goal behind the exhibition of works designed by Kahn for use in Jewish ritual. It's the beginning of an attempt to highlight the relevance the Bible still holds for contemporary art audiences. The premise for this museum is there's this one book, the Bible, right, that's influenced our culture more than any other. And whether you're Jewish, whether you're Christian, whether you're neither, you know, you can't be fully literate, visually literate, if you don't know something about the Bible. There, there are concepts, there are symbols, there are themes that come through in art that's not made for the church, that's not made for the synagogue. You know, they're part of our visual and material culture, and that's what we're interested in exploring. And Khan, who is one of only a handful of major living artists focusing on Jewish themes, is seen as the perfect choice to launch what will be a series of exhibitions by contemporary artists at Mobia. You know, this Toby's art was really a shoe-in for Mobia because we are all about art that was inspired by the Bible and art and religion kind of in the same sentence. And Toby's one of the few contemporary artists who does this so incredibly well. To hear more from Khan and to find out which synagogues will house these works, tune into the broadcast version of the Week in Review. Finally, a movement to see women among the clergy of the Orthodox community is achieving some results. A handful of women are now in clergy roles in different synagogues, and one event brought several of them together to discuss their progress for women in Orthodox leadership. Rebecca Honig Friedman has that story. Three Orthodox women in clergy roles at synagogues came together last week at the JCC Manhattan for Beyond the Glass Ceiling, New Orthodox Leadership Roles for Women, a panel organized by the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance, or JOFA. This is not something that we could have even dreamed about 20 years ago. And I, I feel it's a historic evening. I really do. The panel included most of the mere handful of women currently functioning in leadership positions in Orthodox congregations. Maharat Sarah Hurwitz, a member of the rabbinic staff of the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale, Rosh Kehila Dina Naiman, the leader of congregation Kehilat Orech Eliezer, commonly known as KOE, and Lynn Kay, assistant congregational leader of Sheirith Israel, the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. All of these women entered their current positions within the last six years. And while the positions these women hold may currently be limited to a small number of modern Orthodox congregations in major metropolitan areas, panelists were hoping to inspire others to follow in their footsteps. My goal is to let people know that, that this isn't just a woman here and a woman there that's doing it, but actually people in this audience could become religious leaders, leaders in this shul. And the second goal is to inspire people who are lay leaders to advocate uh, for having more female religious leaders in their synagogues and on college campuses and on, in schools. To learn more about how these women are changing traditional Orthodox roles and the one panelist who's at the very head of her synagogue, see the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Rebecca. That's all for this week. For more news and analysis from the Jewish Channel during the week, please check out our blog at newsdesk.tjctv.com. For the full broadcast version of the Week in Review, including additional stories, interviews, and features, please stop by the Jewish Channel on cable. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable, IO Optimum Cable Channel 291, Time Warner Cable Channel 528, RCN Channel 268, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and Cox Cable Channel 1. 
For more information, visit TJCTV.com.